We talked about cardinal mo movements when we were early in the semester. We, were, we worked with the birth simulator and we talked about a, a delivering the baby with the birth simulator. There are five, what, six? A lot. The cardinal motions, okay? And they, these are what every baby has to do in order to be born, okay? So the first is descent. Obvious, just what it sounds like. They move down through the birth canal and it goes from the beginning of labor to the end of labor. The baby is in a constant state of descent. The next is flexion. Flexion is what? Decreasing the angle, right? So they ball up into a tight little ball and they flex into a tight little ball, okay? To make themselves kind of bullet shaped. What would be internal rotation? So remember the shape of the pelvis, right? It tends to be an oval on the top from front to back. So the baby has to come in this way. Then the middle of the pelvis is a big open circle, right? So he comes in this way, then he rotates. Then he comes to the outside, he has to rotate again, okay? So that rotation as he moves through the pelvis is called internal rotation. Okay, so he's in the pelvis and he's rotating from one, one oval to the next oval as he moves through the pelvis. And you will see it when you're doing your, your vaginal assessments and you're watching the baby's occiput. You'll see it rotate this way and it go around this way or rotate this way then it'll rotate that way as he negotiates through the pelvis. Okay? Extension. This is when he is coming out of the birth canal underneath the pubic bone. Okay? As he starts to crown, the pubic bone hits him on the back of the head, keeps him flexed, he passes the pubic bone, and he extends because the bone is pushing in the base of his neck. Yeah. Okay? And the baby comes out and extends and looks straight out for a second. Okay? It's kind of cute when they come in, they're like, Hi! <laughs> okay? That's extension. Restitution is their head comes out in this direction, but their shoulders are this direction. So they come out and then their shoulders turn. And that restitution allows the shoulder to be born. Okay? Because the... Uh, the, uh, uh, the, their, their shoulders are kind of crooked and they want to come up to 90 degrees because the pelvis is a, is a pyramid, right? Mm -hmm. And so when they're born and their shoulders are in this direction, they have to come up here where the largest angle of the pelvis is and slip that anterior shoulder up underneath the pubic bone. So they restitute. They come out and you'll watch their head will turn, okay? Because when they come out, they're like this and their shoulders are coming through the pelvis. And then as soon as they come out, their head goes to allow the shoulder to dip through. Okay? That's restitution. External rotation is they come out this way, and as soon as they get out of the birth canal, they come back this way and they come out. Okay? And then expulsion is getting the heck out. Okay? So those are the cardinal movements of labor as the baby rocks through the birth canal. Watch your birth animations, you'll see. They're not just a bullet that's coming through. They kind of rock one way, then they rock the other way, then they extend, and their bodies turn, and they kind of dance their way out of the pelvis. Because they're a passenger, they're not a passenger, they're a participant. They're actively moving in ways that will facilitate their birth. They're not in there, that's not accidental. And that's not happening by the hand of God. That's happening because the baby is turning himself in order to make those motions, okay? And it's a, it's a very purposeful dance, and they all do it pretty much always the same way, okay? Now, let's move on to umbilical cord clamping, okay? Okay, okay. The book, I love how the book says, like, research doesn't, like, something about how, basically how it says it doesn't support, or benefits to uh -huh. like for right. Like they're, uh, uh, baby right exactly preemie babies have the most um, have the most definite change okay and whenever I see statements like that I always remind myself the fish don't know their well. okay I love you guys read about acrocyanosis have you guys read about acrocyanosis yet that's part of newborn transition anyone know what acrocyanosis is what were you about to ask a question but it not about acrocyanosis. That's fine. I was just going to ask you, as long as everybody's kind of okay with it for like two, three minutes, could you tell us exactly what chapter on the test? Uh, we'll see where we go at the end. Okay. How far we can get. Okay. Okay. I'm thinking at least up to 14. Mm -hmm. Okay. 15 and 16 is postpartum and postpartum complications. I don't know if we'll get there. Okay. Okay. So who knows what acrocyanosis is? Sounds like. Turning, turning, this is one that yeah, doesn't really help. 
Acrocyanosis is the blueness in a baby's hands and feet. Anyone ever see a newborn that got blue hands and feet? Yeah. And what did your nurses tell you when you looked at the baby's blue hands and feet? What did they say? They said it was normal, right? Why is it normal? Any idea? Is it because of the positioning when they're coming down? No. Nope. I'll tell you, it's not normal. It's iatrogenic hypovolemia. Okay. It's not normal at all. But read your book, and when it looks, talks about acrocyanosis, it'll talk about the common or normal um, blue of the hands and feet when the baby is born. Okay? It and they'll normal? describe it as peripheral vasal constriction of the newborn. Okay? The question is, why are they peripherally vasal constricted? Because they don't have enough blood for their entire body. And what you'll often hear them say is, well, a newborn, just their heart isn't strong enough to get blood out to their fingers. Which, if you think about it, isn't that kind of stupid? Mm -hmm. How did the fingers develop without circulation? Right. They can't develop without circulation, okay? They need to be fully vascular in order to develop. And if you guys ever heard of that uh, fetal surgery where they repair spina bifida while the baby is still in its mother's womb, mm -hmm. okay? That came out back in the late 90s, I believe it was, and it was a wonderful Time Magazine cover article. <laughs> absolutely famous, it was staged by the way, but <laughs> where the, 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 doc, the surgeon's hand is there and the baby's hand is wrapped around his finger, okay? Because of course, any baby, you put something in their hand, they will automatically grab it. That's palmar reflex, babies have to do it. It's, it's a mammalian thing, right? So they did it, but what's fascinating about that picture? That hand is pink, okay? That is not a blue hand, and that's a 20-week infant. Okay, 20 weeks gestation, and he can put b blue, hand, pink hands and feet. Why is a 20 weeker able to put pink in his hands and feet, and a 40 weeker is not able to put pink in his hands and feet? What's the difference? One is still connected to his placenta, the other is not. Okay, and this is one of those failings of understanding why the book says things like this is, you know, there's, there's limited understanding, whatever. The problem with it is. In fetal life, how much cardiac output goes to the lungs? Not much, right? There's, a, there's an increased vascular resistance in the pulmonary structure, and it keeps blood from entering the lungs. 8%, okay? With the first breath, all of a sudden, the vasculature relaxes in the pulmonary system, and blood flow, flows in, all right, and closes that ductus arteriosus, okay? And when that happens, 40% of the cardiac output goes to the lungs. Right? So, the difference between 8 and 40% is 32%, right? Mm -hmm. Now, how much of baby's blood volume is in the placenta at term before he's born? Anyone know? 30%. Okay? So, does 30 and 32 sound pretty darn close? Sure does, because in utero, the lungs aren't being, aren't the organ of, exp uh, of, uh, of respiration, right? So the lungs aren't working. They're not getting any of the resources that they need because they're not working right now. Where is all the respiration occurring? In the placenta, okay? So when baby is born and we immediately clamp the cord, what we've done is left 30% of his blood volume in the placenta, but we've opened up this huge vascular network in the chest that he was not using before. Okay, so now his lungs have to expand and they have to fill with blood, and where are they going to get blood from? They would normally get it from the placenta, but they can't get it from the placenta, so they have to get it from somewhere else. Where is the only available ref, uh, reservoir of blood in a newborn? Where does he have extra blood that he doesn't really need? Hands and feet. So he gets peripheral vasoconstriction, and his hands and feet turn blue, and it shunts all the blood to his lungs so his lungs can learn how to work. Okay, so the problem is that babies are pretty tough and they'll survive despite everything we do to them. Okay, and so they are designed to be alive, they are designed to survive the birth process, they are designed to be squeezed for 90 seconds every two to three minutes, they're designed to be pushed through a very narrow air, uh, uh, opening, and they're so darn tough that a term baby who's a healthy is not going to get sick because you do immediate cord clamping, he's just going to turn blue. His face is going to get pale, and he's going to be kind of tired and lethargic for the first couple of days. What would happen to all of you if I took one-third of your blood volume? Your hands and feet would get pale, you'd be lethargic, have no energy, and you'd be like, oh, oh, I feel like crap. 
What did you do to me? I took away all your oxygen carrying capacity. Okay? And that's why newborns act that way. But immediate cord clamping began back in the 60s. And so for the last 55 years or so, every baby has had immediate cord clamping. So all the knowledge of what a healthy newborn looks like is lost. And you're not going to find it in your textbooks. And so when, when you're trying to do a research study on, on newborns, you know what an immediate cord clamp baby looks like, and that's normal. So you compare that baby to a delayed cord clamp baby, and you go, well, he looks fine. He's doing the same as they, they always act like this. Not realizing that that's an iatrogenic complication. Okay? Babies aren't supposed to sleep for the first 48 hours. It's just that they have no energy. Okay? And the research is fairly clear that babies who have, who have delayed cord clamping have less anemia at four months of age, um, breastfeed better and breastfeed longer without complication. That they're not nearly as sleepy as, uh, as, as term babies who have immediate cord clamping. Yes, ma'am? Is it the length matters? How the length of, you mean the length of the cord or how much yeah, time it takes? how much you, like, how far you cut How far you cut No, it doesn't matter. Um, unless you're going to practice cord stripping, and that is with like really sick babies, um, a wise neonatologist will say, look, this baby is going to come out really, really bad, and I need him here as fast as you can get him to me, so I want you to leave me a good foot or two of umbilical cord to cut it. And what they'll do is you cut the cord real long, and you pass the baby over, and he holds it up and strips all that blood into the baby and gives him a transfusion of blood, and the baby just goes, whoop, pinks right up. Yep, because... Blood is not just a filler, right? Blood is a living liquid that carries oxygen and nutrients. And if you don't have blood, you don't have oxygen, okay? And if you don't have oxygen, you don't thrive, okay? And so that's what that's all about. Now, the difference between a preterm baby and a term baby is term babies are pretty darn tough. They'll survive no matter what, and they just act like what we thought normal babies are supposed to look like, okay? But you compare a baby born in a hospital to a baby born at home, they are night and day different, okay? They're very different because at home births almost always have no pitocin and delayed cord clamping. Okay, mm -hmm. they're a very physiologic birth, whereas babies born in a hospital have you know all kinds of interventions that home yeah, babies right. don't have. Okay, so but now preterm babies they're sick, right? A preterm baby is born critically ill and they're weak already. So you stress them with immediate cord clamping and they go downhill fast. And so babies who are preterm who have immediate cord clamping have a higher rate of necrotizing intercolitis, which is the bowels, the bowels uh, um, infarct and die and they have to be replaced or you know, cut out and turned into a colostomy. Um, or uh, intraventricular hemorrhage where they burst blood vessels in the brain. Usually it comes during a blood transfusion why would you have to transfuse a preterm baby? Because you left all his blood behind, okay, somewhere else. Because a preterm baby, half of their blood is in the placenta, doing the work of the, of the respirations. Um, and so preterm babies are particularly vulnerable, okay? Um, and then the other one is infection. They get a much higher rate of infection among preterm babies who have immediate cord clamping. Okay. And the other part about the controversy is we demand a 95% p-value, right? In order for something to be significant, it has to be, you have to be able to prove not with 95% certainty that it wasn't an accident that you got that finding, okay? Well, most things in medicine are 70, 80% of the time. Tylenol doesn't even work on 95% of the people, okay? And so if we set our p-values a little bit lower, we would see more dramatic uh, changes in our research for, uh, in what we consider um, uh, works and doesn't work. But wouldn't there be too many variables to come? There would. There would be. There's a, there's a takeaway, right? Yeah. You get some. You get more false positives. Right. You know, more accidents. But you would see that more things work than you think. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the controversy. Um, if you're ever around me or anybody that I've trained and they go to cut that cord, I will literally smack them. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Are you supposed to wait prior to the, like for delayed cord clamping? Mm -hmm. Is there a set time? No, and that's one of the problems with our research protocols, mm -hmm. is that we don't have a set time. As a general rule, we say until the cord stops pulsing and the cord gets thin and kind of scraggly. Okay? As a, it's about three to five minutes above the perineum. Mm -hmm. Now, there's some pretty interesting research. If you hold the baby below mom's perineum, like her, her butt is here and you hold him down here, less than a minute, that kid pinks right up. It's amazing because blood flows downhill fast. Mm -hmm. okay? I think that was research that I was looking at. Yeah. It said if you hold it, I think it was anywhere between... Mm -hmm. It runs really fast. At the perineum, it's three minutes, and above the perineum, it's five minutes. But eh, just you put the baby on mom's chest and you leave them there. 
Okay? And then um, after the cord is cut, everybody wants to know how many vessels in that cord? Should always be three. If you have two vessels in the cord, it means you might only have one kidney, right? And then we collect cord samples for the laboratory analysis. What are we looking for in the cord blood? What do you think is most important in the cord blood? What's that? What was the question? What, why, what labs are we drawing from the umbilical cord, or from umbilical cord blood? Not stem cells. That's cord blood donation, and that can be pretty darn useful. But every single baby, we test this. Like hematocrit? Nope. Blood type. Blood type. Okay? So we get all babies' blood type. Now, we only need to know it if mom has an O blood type. But if mom is A or B, we want to know just because. Okay? And we'll talk about that when we talk about newborns. Okay? But we can. We can do stem cells. We can collect stem cells from the umbilical cord. And I always joke with my patients that, you know, if that umbilical, board, um, umbilical cord blood stem cells are so valuable, maybe the baby needs it in the first place. Okay? There's a fascinating study done probably 15 years ago now where they took baby rats, and as soon as they were born, they clamped one of their carotid arteries and caused a stroke. Okay? Gave them a brain injury. And then they measured how the baby rats would walk, how far apart they could move their feet. Okay? Then they took uh, umbilical, rat umbilical cord blood and they tagged it with a nuclear isotope so they could see it and they injected it into these baby rats. And then they saw how far they went and their, their brain injury went away. Okay? That their body was able to partially heal from the brain injury because of the umbilical cord blood. And when they, then they sacrificed the rats and looked in their brains and saw all of that tagged cord blood was at the site of the brain injury. How amazing. Because there, there, the theory is that there are chemical messengers in the umbilical cord that takes that umbilical cord blood to the sites of injury where it needs to be and will help the baby to recover from any birth trauma. Okay? Let's see here. Now, nursing diagnoses. Things that are nurses that we might need to know as nurses. Okay? These are some of the most common labor nursing diagnoses. Pain, knowledge deficit, anxiety, fatigue, risk for infection, impaired fetal gas exchange. These are definitely the kind of things that you're thinking about as you're helping a woman labor, right? Mm -hmm. Pain related to contractions or, you know, anxiety related to fear or knowledge deficit. She has no idea what she's talking about, right? Risk for gas or risk for infection because they have their um, amniotic... Um, their water is broken, so they could get an a uterine infection or perineum, you know, lacerates or gets an episiotomy. They could have an infection there, right? An impaired fetal gas exchange. All of fetal monitoring re revolves around the possibility for impaired fetal gas exchange, either risk for or not. Okay? So when you're thinking about your, your things that you're going to do on your test and you're answering these questions, think about nursing diagnoses and what would I do, to, how can I make that diagnosis and what can I do to improve or how can I change it, okay? How can I impact it? Now, third and fourth stage of labor. The third stage of labor is from birth to the delivery of the placenta. It usually lasts five to, five to 15 minutes or so. After 30 minutes, we have to manually go and remove the placenta because there's something wrong at 30 minutes, okay? If it doesn't come that in. Um, this is the most dangerous time for postpartum hemorrhage. This is when you're gonna see your catastrophic postpartum hemorrhage is during the third stage, okay? And I feel like we've talked about postpartum hemorrhage an awful lot. We talked about why it happens. Uh, we talked about why, you know, what, you know, how the placenta separates from the uterine wall, how the uterus contracts down around the, where it used to be a baby, and why that happens. And remember when I talked about how um, if you leave a piece of the placenta or blood clots in the uterus, the uterus won't contract around it? Remember that? Mm -hmm. That's important stuff. Foreign bodies left in the uterus keep the uterus from contracting and cause it to get boggy and release more blood. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then facilitating maternal infant attachment. You cannot facilitate maternal infant attachment if they're in two different rooms, can you? No. Absolutely not. There's only one place for a newborn to be, and where is that? Right there. This is the baby's natural habitat. And if you move the baby away from here, you put the baby at risk. Okay? So we need to keep baby here as much as possible. And the only time we take them away is because we're going to do something to benefit the baby. Okay? where the risk to the baby is higher if we don't do it to them, okay? And that's an important thing to understand. We have this normal process 
And if we're not doing what's normal, there, there might be a risk associated with it. And we have to justify why we're violating the normal process. Yes, ma'am. Quick question. So would that include getting the information as far as like weight and vitals and making sure? Sure. Okay. sure would. Why do we do the weight? And, why do we do the, the weight? What does it matter? Because it goes on birth certificate. Because it goes on birth certificate. Okay. But is his weight going to change in the next three or four or five hours? Based on history at the postpartum, the uh -huh. birth certificate isn't even done until the next day. Right. Exactly. First it's first several all, days later. Do you want to monitor if the baby's eating and growing? Sure. Can That's you do that? I mean, can you do that if he's on a warmer? He can't eat from a warmer, can he? The baby's not going to gain a significant amount of weight within the first hour, so there's no sure. reason for it to have to... Sure. Unless it's, like, this big and needs to go straight to NICU or something. I mean, there's absolutely no reason. Exactly. And there's where, the, there's where the interesting thing comes in, right? At what point is he safer off his mom's chest? Right. If you, you know, he's sick and he needs antibiotics, so we got to get those antibiotics ordered. We need to put an IV in, and we need to find out how much he weighs because we order AMP and GEMP based on the weight. Okay, you've justified. You get him off. You weigh him. You put him back on mom's okay. chest. He's a micro preemie. He weighs 500 grams. We need to know how much he weighs. We need to get his medicines going. We need to make him breathe. That's a that's safer to get him on the warmer than to leave him with mom. But a term healthy newborn with no problems, if we're weighing him and giving him a bath, what are we doing? We're doing our housekeeping work. Right. Is that going to help him be healthy? No. All it does is we have this list of things we have to do, and we have to get them done. Well, they can certainly wait. Mm -hmm. My favorite is yeah. people say, but mom wants to know how much her baby weighs. And I call that a teachable moment. Mm -hmm. okay? Because every time my mom will say, how much does he weigh? I go, I don't know. You're holding him. You tell me how much he weighs. <laughs> What does it matter how much he weighs? Okay. Well, I gotta know why. So you is that gonna help him? The you said now. Exactly. Are like you gonna do that right now? Right. No. When we got time. I'm sorry, but unless you're in the hospital, you don't need to know my child's weight. I'm with you. Now, my my, I, I was telling some people. I did a virtual lactation consult last night, where a very good friend of mine, he was actually a Naval Academy grad, and we had him at our house while he was in the Naval Academy. You know, he'd come and spend the weekends with us. You know, we went to church together. He's a cute kid, uh, Nico. So he got married a couple years ago, or they just had their first baby um, uh, five days ago, on my anniversary, by the way. So just had his first baby. And so I, um, I was talking to him, you know, last night and helping him and his wife breastfeed. But when, the baby, when they were admitted to the hospital, he wrote, you know, we're admitted to the hospital, you know, it's been a long 48 hours, you know, of early labor, you know, but we're, you know, we'll keep you posted. And I responded, don't you dare keep us posted, okay? Labor, deliver, rest, let me know next week how things are going, okay? We, we, birth is not a social event, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, a spectator sport. Okay, your mom and dad doesn't need to know how much the baby weighs 20 minutes after he's born. Yeah. It can wait, yeah. okay? And whenever moms say, well, how much does he weigh? I say, who cares? We'll collect the data later. Right now we're going to do what's important, and that is we're going to facilitate maternal infant attachment. We're going to breastfeed. We're going to get the basics down first. We're going to make sure he can breathe, and we're going to make sure he can maintain his temperature. We're going to do the important things, and then we'll weigh him and give him a bath some other time, okay? And it's a matter of who are you here to help? Are you here to help yourself? Or are you here to help the baby? Are you here to help the mother? Who are you here to help? Definitely not here to help the hospital find out how much this baby weighs. Okay? <laughs> the hospital doesn't really care anyway. Okay? So by habit, we tend to do what we think is important to ourselves before what needs to be done to the patient. And it just doesn't need to be done. It's like waking someone up at 2 in the morning to give them a Tylenol. Okay? It's just stupid. Oh, it was ordered at that time, but they don't mean it. Okay, let them sleep. <laughs> they don't mean it. They don't mean it. Okay, third stage of labor. All right, we talked about all this. Those are the signs of uh, the signs of cord is coming. The placenta is coming. I know, but you know we're going to do that. We did all this in the lab. We talked about pitocin. We talked about the uh, inspecting the placenta. We talked about offering emotional support. Okay. I love when I do these sim labs, I can just skip over stuff, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, immediate care of the newborn. These are the things that we need to do on the newborn. We need to make sure he has a patent airway. We need to keep him warm. We need to make sure we need to check his APGAR scores, which are really kind of worthless. Yeah. And most important, we need to identify the newborn, okay? Because all those newborns look alike. You get five or six of them together in a room, and you can't tell who's who. Yeah. So what do we do in most hospitals? 
bands. For there you go. Two or three bands to identify the baby, okay? Yeah. One on a wrist, one on an ankle, one on mom's wrist, one on dad's wrist, okay? So everybody has these bands. And every time we touch that baby, we look at the wrist, we look at the band, and we look at mom or dad's number, we identify the number. This is baby number 4,562. Got it. We take them away, we bring them back. This is baby number 4,562. Got it. Okay. Every single time mom or baby are separated, even if it's across the room for a hearing exam, you need to double check the bands and make sure you have the same baby. I promise you, give someone the wrong baby just once and you will end up on CNN. Okay? Not just sued, you will be on TV. Okay? In the Army, we always say, never do anything you don't want to see on the New York Times. Okay? I don't want to see it on the cover of the New York Times, I'm not doing it. I promise. Mix a baby up just once. <laughs> You do. You always do. Like, yeah, because it used to happen all the time. It doesn't anymore because we've identified the baby. Okay. Fourth stage of labor. This is the part that everybody forgets about. The fourth stage of labor is the recovery from birth. Okay. The recovery from pregnancy. It's from the delivery of the placenta to the next two months, and that's why the body returns to its pre-pregnant state. Okay. We talk about it specifically um, um, in the early postpartum, and then they forget about it after that. But the early postpartum, this is on the mother-baby unit, or what do they call it in kink care, the family-centered care unit, okay? And this is where we're returning, we're getting the uterus to involute and return back to normal. We want to make sure it stays nice and firm. We want to control mom's bleeding, make sure mom's not bleeding, control her pain. And most of the nursing care done in the mother-baby unit is education, okay? Very little physical nursing. It's all education, it's all preparation, it's all screening for possible risk injury, risks of like, you know, child abuse or inappropriate bonding or, you know, making sure that they don't live in a cardboard box under a bridge somewhere, okay? And in nursing care, you want to assess the lochia, okay? Lochia is what? What is lochia? How can you assess it if you don't know what it is? Vaginal discharge, okay, more specifically? Bleeding. <laughs> it's, that, it's the postpartum bleeding, okay? Um, it's, there are three types of lochia, lochia rubra, ro, lochia, al, uh, lochia rubra, lochia serosa, lochia alba, okay? In the first couple days, it's all lochia rubra, which is just a fancy word for red blood, okay? I had a patient once said, ooh, lochia, that's a pretty name. I'm gonna name my baby lochia. They did, they named her lochia. Yep. I was like, really, really, no, you, no, you don't want to name her Lokia. No, no, no one will know it's Lokia. It's Lokia, that's pretty. Lokia sounds good. I'm like, no, no, you're naming your baby after birth. Please don't do it to her. Fine, she's going to have a baby someday, and she's going to show up at the OB, up. we're going to go, Lokia Jones? Really? Lokia? Okay. <laughs> so you're going to check vital signs. Usually it's every 12 hours. Urine output, usually every 12 hours. Um, offer blankets for shivering. I meant to ask Donna while they were here if home birth moms shiver like hospital birth moms. I forgot to ask. I know, like, um, I, my family, when she first I you, they put the epidural. Mm -hmm. But um, my nurse said that a lot of the times they get it from the epidural. Yeah. They call it the epidural shakes. Yeah. It's, they're not cold. No. They just shake for no reason. Yeah, and we don't really understand why it is. The theory is that when you have an epidural, you don't use all of your energy that your body has built up for labor, okay? Because most of the time with epidural, you just sit there, okay? Mm -hmm. Where in, re in, in active labor without an epidural, you're active. You're moving, you're squatting, you're jumping all around, you're doing all kinds of movements, and you're working real hard. Epidurals is not a lot of hard work in labor, okay? But yeah, they shiver an awful lot, and when putting warm blankets on them settles it down more for the weight than anything else. Okay? Promote comfort and facilitate attachment and breastfeeding. Right? Risk signs, things that we're looking for is sudden drop in blood pressure or rise in the heart rate. That's postpartum hemorrhage until proven otherwise. Excessive bleeding and a boggy uterus that's not contracting. And we all saw, and when we let Lucy bleed to death, 
what happens with our vital signs and how we fill up the dead with blood, right? I have actually heard bleeding, okay? Audible hemorrhage, where you walk in a room and you're like, what is that noise? And it's bleeding, okay? <laughs> we run, it's like you turn on a hose and just let it run. Okay, yeah, they bleed a lot, a lot, lot, lot. Lokia. Right. Now, we talked a lot about labor support, so I'm not going to talk about any non-pharmacologic labor support, okay? Now, did you guys talk about where pain comes from in labor? No? Okay. So, where pain comes from? You know, why does it hurt? Okay. Now, humans are one of the only mammals that suffer through birth. We are the only ones that have any kind of suffering. And Robert Bradley and people like Robert Bradley will say that most of that is fear. That pain and fear looks an awful lot alike. Okay? Whereas women who are well-educated, well-prepared for labor, they don't yell and scream and yell and call for their mother. But women who are afraid, they do. Okay? Now, so a big piece of it is fear. Definitely. And you see it every single day on labor and delivery. I'll see a woman coming in, yelling and screaming and losing her religion. And I come up next to her and I rub her belly and I whisper in her ear, you're doing a beautiful job, Mom. Everything's okay. I want you to take that energy and I want you to bring it in here. And I want you to use that energy on your uterus and help you move that baby through. There you go. Calm, little more quiet. There you go. Deep, easy breathing. Let's talk about your beautiful baby. And take her energy away from the uterus and take everything so that she's thinking about how safe she is. And how you're going to be okay. It's just a contraction. It can't hurt you. Okay? It's not going to break a bone. It's not going to blow a hole in your muscles. It just tightens and it goes away. And you're stronger than that. That kind of thing. And she'll go from... Ah! To, oh, oh, to, oh. And perfect. And I've taken away most of her, her pain. How? Because I took her, pain, her fear away. I took away her sense of lost control. Okay. Now, the reality is the uterus is a muscle, okay? And if I pick up this chair, this doesn't hurt. I can move my bicep all the time, and this doesn't hurt, right? No problem. I can do it over and over and over again. But how long does labor last? Or weeks, right? Imagine I'm doing this every three minutes. Hold it, and then I'm putting it down. What's going to happen to my biceps sooner or later? It's going to get tired, right? It's going to get tired and I'm going to start to get ischemic pain. I'm going to start to get fatigue. And so the uterine muscle, just like any other muscle, it does fatigue. Okay? It's amazingly powerful and it takes a long time to fatigue, but it does. Okay? So there is, a, there is a part of the discomfort is in the fatigue and the ischemia caused by these muscle contractions. You know, if you take this thing and I hold it like this, after a little while, my muscle is going to start to burn, right? That's the ischemia and fatigue. And the same thing happens in the uterus. So don't ever let it, don't ever think that I, I don't think labor hurts, okay? I understand there's a discomfort to it, okay? But the vast majority is fear and anxiety, much more than it is actual ischemic pain. The other part is this. If I told you from the moment you were born that every time you did this, it was going to cause pain in your, your shoulder, your, your arm, okay? You would start to be afraid that this is going to cause pain, right? Okay? And then I told you, guess what? You're not really moving your arm if it doesn't hurt, okay? It has to hurt or else that's not really a movement. Then what's going to happen? Your brain is going to create pain to validate the fact that your muscle's moving, okay? So now let's take that and turn that into uterine contractions. What do all little girls hear about labor from the moment they start talking about having a baby? Pain. It hurts, okay? Contractions suck. Girl, you're going to be okay, but you're going to have to work through it. This is horrible, but you're strong and you can do it, okay? And then what do you hear from your doctors? And what did we hear in the, what, was, what was on the slides and what did you see in your books? There are false contractions and they don't count because they don't hurt, okay? So we set up an awful lot of this pain and suffering it, by doing that kind of stuff to women their entire lives. We turn labor from this beautiful event that you, that you, you tr this transformative event where you turn it into this, this super, super human being. We take it from that event to a traumatic, you're going to die, and birth is something that you survive. 
that you suffer through, and you need all kinds of medical professionals to keep you alive, and aren't you happy that we were here to keep you alive? Yeah. Does that sound like fun? Yeah. No. So birth is not that. Birth is this beautiful event that you have to rock and roll through. And just like a little kid learning how to walk, you fall and you stumble, and you skin your knees and you bump your head. I get it. Okay, it's not perfect, but it's definitely not this traumatic, horrible thing. And so a lot of the pain that we have associated with birth comes from the environment that we set and how we create it, how we have pain, how we have perceptions of pain instead of actual pain. Okay? Let's go on. So I think we've already talked about all of these things. Let me move on. Gate control theory. You guys learned a lot about gate control, right? Yep. So we don't need to talk about that at all. You see, right? All right, pharmacological measures. These are the things that they did not talk about in their class, okay? So these are some of the, the classes of drugs that we can use. Just keep flipping, you'll find it. It is slide number 68, okay? So yes, we use sedatives and we use anti-emetics. Uh, anti what are those? What drugs are sedatives and anti-emetics? <coughs> hmm? Are you more like specific? Like well, what's the name of the drug? Oh. You mix it with your narcotics all the time. So, fen Phenergan, right? Phenergan. Yep. We've, we give an awful lot of Phenergan. Barbiturates? Um, um, what are the barbiturates? Like Fioraset is a barbiturate. What is the barbiturate that we use? Fioraset. It's a headache medicine. Oh, I know. I know. Yeah, we don't we don't give it in birth. I'm trying to think of what is the barbiturate. I don't think we use we never use barbiturates in labor. I never have. Benzodiazepines again, I don't use them. And H1 receptor agonists. That's like that's a Zofran and a Visceril. Analgesics. Um, there notice there are two words: analgesic and anesthetic. Two totally different classes. An analgesic treats pain. An anesthetic blocks pain. Okay? So an epidural is an anesthetic, not an analgesic. Morphine is an analgesic. Okay? Because it works by altering your perception of the pain. Okay? So there are opioid agonists, um, <clears throat> analgesics, and those are, that's morphine, Demerol, um, uh, uh, Nubane. And then, I'm sorry, not Nubane, morphine and Demerol. And uh, uh, also included in those are like your Percocets, your, um, your, De your Darvocets, that sort of stuff. And then there are your agonist, antagonist analgesics, and that's Nubane. Okay? Nubane is an amazing drug. It both stimulates and deadens the, the Mu receptors. Pretty darn cool. Um, if you have a woman who has a C-section and she has a, uh, um, a duramorph spinal and she's itching postpartum, give her Nubane and her itching will go away. Pretty darn cool stuff because it's a moo agonist. Um, but it's a pretty decent pain reliever, um, especially around labor. And then your opioid antagonists, I think, are like Darvocet. But the important thing to understand about these are they are opioid-based uh, narcotics, basically. Okay? And we use them in labor to alter a woman's perception of pain. They don't take the pain away. They just make you so high you don't care about the pain. Okay? And they, there are some good and some bad to them. The good is that they, 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 they are no longer the suffering, to choose, to, for lack of a better word, okay? The bad is that we've now altered their consciousness, and their memory of that event is going to be different, okay? That they're going to have a difficulty interacting with their baby if they're high as a kite. Yep. And some of this is going to go to the baby, and baby's going to get real sleepy, okay? And they can come out kind of high and have a hard time eating, because they're high as a kite. Okay. Then there are nerve block anesthetics, and these are your spinals, your epidurals, that kind of thing. Um, they're placed into the space around the spinal column. They're not placed in the spinal column. They're placed around it. If you remember your basic anatomy, there's the dura, and then there's the epidural space around the spine. Okay? So a spinal goes into the, the, into the dural space, and an epidural goes into the epidural space. Spinals get a little bit closer to the spinal column than epidurals. But they have the same effect, and that is that you go numb from the, from the, from the injection site down. Okay? They're wonderful forms of pain relief in that they stop it cold most of the time. Okay? 
There's no perfect epidural or spinal, but they work pretty darn well. Okay? Um, and there, there's no such thing as a free lunch. There's a price to be paid for having these, for having spinals or epidurals. There are. Um, I think you guys talked about them in the class, right? Mm -hmm. That they do increase your risk of complications, specifically hypotension, placental perfusion problems, and breathing patterns. When you've got this ineffective breathing pattern, that's when your spinal goes up and set it down, and they go up into the lungs, and they can they can they can um, paralyze the lungs and make it very very difficult to breathe. Okay. Yes. Um, is there a certain angle that you have to lay in order for the medicine to effectively work? Or is it just kind um, of... Conventional wisdom suggests that, okay? Mm -hmm. They talk about after a spinal, you want to sit still like this for a while. Yeah. And then if it's heavier on one side than the other, then they roll they onto roll, that side. Yeah. You know, and um, there's something with epidurals. There's something to be said for epidurals with that because we can give a bolus of medicine again and roll them onto their side mm -hmm. so we can encourage it to go that direction. I don't know how evidence-based that is, okay. okay? I've seen it work and I've seen it not work. Oftentimes, if we have a problem with an epidural, we will bolus the epidural a couple times, give them a whole bunch of medicine, see if it makes it better. And if a couple of tries doesn't make it better, we pull it out and do it again. We just figure we missed. It got close, but not close enough. Right. Do you guys understand how anesthetics like lidocaine and, and, uh, and those things work? That they infuse the area around the nerve and block that nerve. Okay? So if they miss that nerve, then it doesn't work at all. Right? You got to hit right around the nerve in order to make it work. That's how, like sometimes when you get your, your, your tooth work done and it doesn't work and they have to give you another shot, they miss. Your nerve's in a different place. But don't ever let, let me tell you that, that epidurals are bad. There's a price to be paid for them. There's no such thing as a free lunch. And it would be better if we didn't use them at all. But there's definitely a reason to have them, and they are useful, okay? They really are. I mean, it would be safer to, to amputate your leg without anesthesia too, okay? It just sucks. <laughs> and so we knock you out so that we can cut off your leg without causing too many problems, right? So anesthesia recognizes that, yeah, you could do it without me, but you really want me here, <laughs> right? And so, there, so, there's, there, but there's, so there's a good and a bad when we talk about those things. And how much risk you're willing to accept will help you determine what you're going to do. Okay. Um, the big, uh, one of the, the 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 common pain in the butt problems that we have with epidurals are these spinal headaches, postural headaches. Well, we we puncture the dura, the the the, um, the what's that stuff in the dura, the brain fluid, it's cerebrospinal fluid. The cerebrospinal fluid leaks and it changes the pressure inside around the brain and it causes amazing headaches intense, incredible headaches, okay? And uh, they're made worse by sitting up. So what they'll do is they'll have this woman postpartum who has an amazing headache, and the anesthesia will come in and say, sit up for me. She'll sit up and go, oh my God, I'm gonna die. He say, oh, okay, that's my fault. That's the anesthesia did that, okay? And we can treat them usually with a lot of pain medicine and caffeine, okay, that helps with that. Um, and we even give IV caffeine, okay? Um, and then, uh, from my kind of guy, and then the other, <laughs> and the other thing we do is what's called a blood patch, where they take a little bit of blood out of your arm and inject it into your spinal fluid, okay? And what does that do? It increases the pressure in the, around the brain, right? And so they can increase it with a, a spinal patch or a blood patch in the spine, because your blood is safe to inject anywhere we want to put it. Your body can absorb it into the spinal fluid the same way it can in the vessels. Um, so it's a nice, safe thing to put in there. Where we wouldn't necessarily want to put like normal saline in somebody's cerebral spinal fluid, but we can use your own blood and it's not going to cause a problem. Okay? And the important thing to understand is that no matter what happens, the pain will go away sooner or later. Okay? Now, everybody's preparing for our preeclampsia, eclampsia lab tomorrow, and I know you guys have read all 60 pages that I gave you, right? And so you know that headaches are dangerous postpartum, right? And so the big problem with those blood patches is trying to decide, is this a spinal post, uh, postural puncture headache, or is this precursor of an eclamptic seizure, and is she going to die tomorrow? Okay? And that's the big problem we have, is trying to determine what kind of headache it is. Okay? As a general rule, if their blood pressure is normal, and it's worse when they sit up than when they lay down, it's anesthesia's fault. If their blood pressure is elevated and they got a headache, it's something I need to take care of. Okay? It's a blood pressure problem. Okay? Lumbar. Now, 
Maternal hypotension. I already mentioned this earlier, right? That if I make you numb from the waist down, your vasculature opens and your blood pressure drops. And so those of you who have been to clinical already, what have you seen they do before they put an epidural in? They take their blood pressure and they do what? Turn that IV up. Turn that IV up. Not only turn it up, they bolus them how much? Usually it's 1,000 cc's as fast as possible. Okay? They give them a bolus of 1,000 cc's in 20 minutes or so, and that boosts their blood pressure a little bit, and then they give them the epidural so that when their blood pressure drops, they kind of come back to stable. Okay? And it just supports them for that. Um, and the important thing is that if your blood pressure drops after an epidural, you know, one, it's not going to hurt anybody, but it sure is scary, and we got to get that blood pressure back up as fast as we can because the baby can't tolerate it. So we give mom, we you know, roll mom back and forth. We give mom some fluid. We recheck her blood pressure, and if we can't get it to come back up in a minute or so, we'll give her a shot of ephedrine, which is going to raise her blood pressure back up again. Okay. I'm always in favor of giving ephedrine, and the anesthesia is always against it. And I'm like, dude, we can fight this for 20 minutes, or you can give her a shot. It takes five seconds. Give her a shot. Give me the med, and I'll do it myself. <laughs> I never do because I would get in trouble if I tried to give a med out of my class, but I, I, I want to. Yeah, they're, they're, I'm, I'm not credentialed to give ephedrine, okay? And neither are you. Uh, only anesthesia is credentialed to give ephedrine because it's a real powerful drug. But it's not going to hurt them. It lasts only a few minutes. It's okay. Um, so disadvantages of an epidural, one, the big one, is that they limit mobility, okay? Mom is no longer forced to rock her baby through the pelvis, okay? She's stuck, and baby tends to get stuck, in, um, and we get what's called bed dystocia. And what I tell everybody when they get an epidural, every 20 or 30 minutes, I want you rocking back and forth. I want you changing position. Left side, right side, sitting up, laying down. I want you changing to help that baby move through the pelvis as much as we can, okay? Common side effects are nausea, vomiting, itching, decreased blood pressure. They're annoying, but they're, they're livable. Accidental injection into the blood vessel, they, they, there's a lot of safety things that prevent that from happening. But if they inject that anesthetic directly into the bloodstream, mom's system is going to collapse, okay? Just for a little while, but it's going to collapse. And we have to bag her and keep her heart going, and it's just not good for people. So what they do is they put the spinal, they put the medicine in, and then they do a little test dose. They'll, they'll give a little bit of a dose of the medicine, just a little, and they watch mom's heart rate and see what happens. And so you'll hear when they're doing an epidural, okay, ready for the test dose? I'm ready for the test dose. Okay, test dose is in. What's the heart rate? Did the heart rate change? No. Did it take her blood pressure? Blood pressure change? No. Great. That means I'm in the right space, okay? And then they can give her the actual medicine. So they do a test dose first, okay? And then the sympathetic blockage is, is when they, they, they shut everything down. Not very good. I've never seen that happen. Big problem is urinary retention and bladder distension because now we've numbed her ability to pee, right? Mm -hmm. And so what happens is once, is once we put a full, um, uh, an epidural in, most hospitals will still use a Foley catheter to keep her bladder empty all the time. It's not absolutely necessary. It increases your risk of UTI to put a Foley catheter in. But it's, it, it's, it's, a lot of people say it's better than straight cath. Because straight cath, you know, you're repeatedly doing epidural or, ep, or catheters. Because mom can't pee, okay? She can't. She's, she's numb and it's not going to happen, okay? And when the bladder distends, it blocks progress for baby. The uterus doesn't, doesn't, um, doesn't contract well and baby doesn't move through the pelvis well. So you got to keep the bladder empty. Um, and then the question is, how do you do it? With a Foley or a straight cath? Either one is okay. Other nerve blocks? They're these really cool combined spinal epidurals um, where they give a spinal and an epidural at the same time. And that, is a, that gives a better blockage. It gives a more complete blockage. Um, they're a little bit tricky, but most of the anesthesiologists I know do combined spinal epidurals. And they're called CSE. So if you ever see on the board CSE written under anesthesia, that's what they have. It's a, both a spinal and an epidural at the same time. Okay, um, And then... The big thing is that once you've done the epidural, now mom has turned into a medical patient, an ICU type patient. She needs much more constant monitoring. You gotta watch her blood pressure, you gotta watch her respiration. You gotta, it takes more work, okay? So it's not really easier, you just shift from labor support to medical support, okay? Then there's general anesthesia. We very rarely ever use general anesthesia anymore, very rare. 
like 1% of women will need uh, general anesthesia, and that's with a crash C-section. Well, we need to get the baby out immediately, and we don't have 10 or 15 minutes for that spinal or epidural to take effect before we do it. And so usually what will happen is you run into the back, all hell is breaking loose, and as soon as you get in the operating room, they put mom on the, they put mom on the bed, the mask goes on her face, and then they can do a C-section in just a few seconds, like 45 seconds, and they can do a C-section much, much faster. We use that when babies are all of a sudden down low and we need to get that baby out immediately. Okay? We don't like to do it because what happens, of course, with general anesthesia? What happens to the baby? They have general anesthesia too, right? And anesthesia comes with a lot of complications. Okay? There is a reason that after surgery you have to go to the post-anesthesia care unit, which is an ICU, right? Because it's a lot coming back out of general anesthesia. So mom and baby are both affected. And their mom's got more chance of hemorrhaging, more chance of infections, more chance of complications. And baby comes out not being able to breathe and needing a bag. And then he's, not, he's high for a while. And he doesn't eat very well. Has anyone ever had general anesthesia? Yeah. Takes a while to recover, doesn't it? You get that funny, I get this funny feeling in my chest. And I breathe funny. It's like every time I breathe, I get this, I breathe something. It's like I'm breathing coal out of my mouth. I'm like, it feels awful. I hate it. That's why I do my ankle surgeries with natural. I do natural ankle surgeries. Well, I, I take a spinal, but I don't let them sedate me. So I'm wide awake in the operating room. Because I hate the feeling of the, 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 the sedatives. I hate them. I told you guys that story about my natural ankle surgeries? Yeah, good. Okay. Now, let's see here. Stuff that you've already done. All right, let's take... Well, we got half an hour. Should we take a quick break? Or should we press on for half an hour? Press on? Three minutes? Okay. All right. If you need a break, get up and move, but I'm going to keep going. How's that? Now, let's talk about labor dystocia. Okay? Labor dystocia is what? Complicated, protracted labor, right? Something is wrong. All right? And it tends to arise. Remember we talked about those P's? The powers, the passenger, the pelvis, the passageway, you know, all that stuff. Whenever we have labor dystocia, we automatically go back to our P's and say, what's wrong? Okay? Pelvis. Pelvis, yep. And then the pelvis passenger relationship and the psyche. Right? And so we have to ask ourselves, what's wrong? Why is this labor not progressing? Remember we talked about Friedman's curve and how we expect a primate to change about one centimeter every hour to hour and a half, right? If we've got this woman and she's not changing, she's been at six centimeters for the last four or five hours, we have to ask ourselves why, right? Is it a power problem? How often is she contracting? Is she contracting powerfully? Are they strong contractions or weak contractions? We don't know, right? We have to assess that. And we, can, we assess that with like a intrauterine pressure catheter. We put them on pitocin, make them contract harder, trying to increase her power. Okay. Is it a passageway problem? Is there something wrong with her pelvis? There are a very specific set of measurements that we do as providers where we measure the pelvis. What is her pubic arch? How, wide, how far apart is her ischial spines? What's the curvature of her tailbone? Okay. You know, you guys remember your white Malloy classifications of uh, pelvises and remember the different shapes? How do you think we figure them out? We figure them out using our hands to measure the different angles. Okay, and so a woman who's got a, 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 an anthropoid pelvis with a deep posterior segment, I'm going to roll her on her hands and knees to encourage that baby to move through the pelvis and avoid the tailbone. Okay, a woman who's got a platypoid pelvis, I'm going to spend more time, you know, sideways. I'm going to, I, I can go in with my hand and adjust the baby's head and turn it to where I need it to be if the passenger is in there a little bit of cattywampus. Okay, if he's supposed to come down like this, but he's coming down like this he's going to cause problems, right? It's called asynclinicism. And if his head is crooked, that little hole isn't going to hold him anymore. And he's got the kind of, you know, very specifically a square hole, a square peg in a round hole, right? And so we actually will reach in and turn the head and try to readjust his head to get him where we want him to be. Okay? So whenever we've got labor dystocia, we want to find out why. What is causing the problem? Where, where can we intervene to make it better? Okay. Now, hypertonic labor. This is tachycystole. Okay, this is when your uterus is contracting too much. It's extremely rare to see a hypertonic labor in a woman who's not on pitocin. Okay, there's really only one time. 
only one time, you're going to have a hypertonic labor on a woman, excuse me, on a woman who's not on Pitocin. Can anyone tell me what it is? What would make the uterus contract like crazy and cause an incredible amount of pain? Is it placental abruption? Placental abruption, thank you. Abruption, okay? <laughs> So whenever you see a um, whenever you see a, a, a hypertonic labor, you got to think about could there be an abruption that's causing this problem, okay? Because what happens when there's something wrong with the baby or something wrong with the mother, the body rejects the baby very quickly, and so they'll they'll uh, with placental abruptions the most common. Another one you see an awful lot, and they don't really have hypertonic labors, but they have very fast labors. Women who have high blood pressure in pregnancy, I've had them deliver in like half an hour. <laughs> they just they go fast. The body just rejects the baby as fast as possible. And that's a bumpy ride. Boy, oh, it's rough, okay? All hell breaks loose for about an hour or so, and then the baby's born, okay? So hypertonic labors are when we have the incredibly powerful labor forces, and they're, they're moving, it's moving very, very quickly. We tend to call them precipitous births, but uh, um, it's more than just fast. It's powerful, okay? Um, when this happens, of course, mom tends to freak out a little bit. There's a whole lot of maternal anxiety. And so you do your best to control the anxiety by, you know, whispering and being calm and relaxed and that kind of thing. And that's hard to do because the whole room fills up with people yelling and screaming. And that does not help, okay? So know that if you've got these hypertonic contractions, one, you want to make sure we figure out why, okay? And two, we want to facilitate calm, relax, and, and slow things down if we can, right? Hypotonic labor. This is when there's not enough power. We have inefficient power. Okay? And hypotonic labor um, you know, is the, probably the most common. It's when labor stalls. They get stuck at five or six centimeters and they just don't move forward. And they need to be augmented. And we give them a little bit of Pitocin and we bring that, labor, that, that power back up again. And it usually works pretty well. Okay? Now, if you're not going to use Pitocin, you can try things more natural like walking or position changes. My favorite is nipple stimulation. I have them get in the shower and let the warm water hit them in the chest. Boy, they contract like crazy when the warm water hits them in the chest. Why? Because it's releasing oxytocin. Because it's releasing oxytocin, exactly. Because nipple stimulation releases oxytocin, okay? And so that's how we breastfeed, is that we baby takes the breast in their mouth and they release oxytocin and it makes the milk come out. So, that, so stimulating the nipples will, is a natural form of, of augmentation. Even if you give them Pitocin? Hmm? You don't need to give Pitocin. You can do it another way. I'm talking about an alternative. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So you don't do one, both. You do one or the other. Right, I okay. do one or the other. Yeah. Okay. And the, the trick is that if I have you do nipple stimulation, I'm not increasing your risk at all. I'm just increasing your contraction pattern naturally. If I do Pitocin, I'm increasing your risk dramatically. And a lot more things have to go into that. Okay. And so because there's a difference between the two drugs. But yeah, um, a lot of times I have women, women get in the shower and stay in there for 20 minutes, half an hour, or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Mm. okay. I thought that we were that study with Pitocin and how it affects oxygen. Yeah. Whether. We talked about that birth, yeah. the, the article about birth. Yeah. That was very frustrating because it was very, you know, um, it was written like a, like, a, um, like a review article where it, it, most of it is, I just don't know. <laughs> you know, yeah. I think, but I'm not exactly sure. I like right. articles to give me an opinion, yes. even if they're not exactly yes. certain. But you can't do that in a review. It's got to be, you, you, can only give it a, you can only tell you what, what is or isn't. Okay? So let's move on. Uh, precipitous birth. A precipitous birth is any labor that is less than four hours. Okay? The definition is less than four hours. They are rapid. They are intense. Okay? And just like the hypertonic labor, the answer is calm everything down, hang on, and go along for the ride. Because okay? you're not in charge of anybody's uterus. You can't slow it down, just like you can't slow down a, a, an express train, okay? You stand there all you want, stop! It'll just pass you right by, okay? Don't push. And the problem, right, Don't push. the problem with precipitous labor is everyone tries to control them. Yeah. You can't. I love a good drive-by delivery. And that's what we call them, is a drive-by. When mom comes in, and she's, oh, 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 I can't, I can't, I just, And then they deliver. <laughs> and, and all the time, everyone is going, 
How do you learn best? What's your address? Do you have a phone number? I need your ID card. Get the IV started. Why don't we? And, yeah. It's like, are you out of your mind? Shut up. She's, she, you know, she got my bank so big. Right. And, I, and what I've known for doing is it'll happen. It's always happening at like four in the morning, and everyone's tired and they're in a bad mood anyway. And I walk into the room and everyone is screaming, and I'm like, all right, everybody, stop. This is what we do here, okay? Just stop. We'll catch the baby and we'll do the paperwork after, okay? <laughs> and because the baby's like this, and they're asking, how do you learn best? Are you safe at home? <laughs> Focus on what's important. Don't ask your stupid questions. Focus on what's going on. Use a little reasoning. Okay? Should be and, you in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Don't ask your stupid questions. There you go. And, and the important thing, and, and, and I, I got to tell you, and this is my bias coming out in me, it's those ADRNs and graduate and diploma nurses who are asking all the stupid questions. The LPNs who are asking the stupid questions. I don't see it from BSNs all that much. BSNs know that they're there. They, they, we practice a lot of deductive reasoning and thinking and why do you do things, right? And so the LPNs, the diploma nurses, the ADRNs, they tend to focus very much on task-oriented stuff because they're very, they're very task-oriented people. Their whole education is task-oriented. They don't have the, the training that allows them to expand out and think about why I'm doing this, okay? And so there, there's a problem with that. And this particular area has been saturated by diploma and ADRNs for decades, okay? You know, Methodist and Fayetteville Tech are brand new BSN programs, okay? Ten years ago, they were not here. If you wanted a BSN, you had to go to Raleigh, okay? And that meant that there were no BSNs here. Okay? Now we're getting them, and that's why all the hospitals are gaga over you guys. You guys know the hospitals love you, okay? They absolutely love you. Cape Fear is like, please, I'll take every Methodist graduate. Bring them on, okay? Because they're not used to BSNs. They're not used to people who have all this, all this, all this training and education. Okay, and so it's important to just kind of you know take a step out of your out of your what I have to do and turn it into why you have to do it, and everything makes is a lot more calm and it makes a whole lot more sense. Okay, no so identifiers. what's that? No patient identifiers. No patient identifiers. What is that about? Well, you know, name, social, what's right. your name, what's your social date of birth. Uh -huh. What you mean, like at Cape Fear or what? No, 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 no. For a precipitous birth. Yeah. Oh. So that baby's coming. I don't care what your. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have, I have actually had. I have friends who. You guys know what a timeout is? Timeout. A timeout. Yeah. When in in yeah. like a surgery, yeah. a timeout, a surgical timeout. It's a safety stop to make sure we've got the right patient, the right procedure. We're we're you know we're amputating his right foot, not his left. That kind of stuff, right? There are hospitals that do timeouts for birth. How stupid is that? Okay. Do I care what your name is if the baby's head's coming out? Can you imagine me going, okay, we need a timeout. This is Mrs. Jones. No, this is Miss Smith. Okay, never mind. And we leave? Yeah. Would we leave the room? No, we're going to do the birth anyway. So every time someone says we should do a timeout, I just kick them out. Go away. Go sit in a corner. <laughs> you go to Stupid. <laughs> you go to <laughs> okay. But the important thing about a precipitous birth is we want to try to slow down the birth of the baby if we can. We want to give time for that tissue to stretch and accommodate the baby. Okay. When they come down really fast, they tend to cause more perineal trauma. So if we can slow it down, we will. And what I try to do is, okay, I know you need to push. I just want you to give me a soft push, not a hard push. Just a little push, just enough to make yourself happy without trying to, you know, ah, blow the baby out, because that can be rough. Okay? But as a general rule, women who are precipting have zero complications when it comes to placental O2, when it comes to, like, perineal lacerations and that kind of stuff. They never get shoulder dystocias. They never get lacerations. They were moving fast because they had the room. Okay? With baby number seven, my <laughs> we were we were in the bed and my wife was in this position. And she pushed. And I said, Okay, baby, has a good job. He's out to the eyebrows. And she said, What do you mean out to the eyebrows? Why isn't he out yet? <laughs> and I said, Well, if you'd get off your ass and push, he'll come. <laughs> and I said, Oh, okay. And she rolled over and he came right out. 
because she was blocking, he was blocking the birth canal by sitting in that position. And when she pushed, she didn't have enough room. When she rolled over on her side, she opened up her pelvis, and the baby was able to come through. <laughs> I know. Right? That goes over well, right? What's that? Did you have your wife come in and guess? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we need to. We need to know. So she can confirm or deny. <laughs> Here's the interesting thing. I keep a journal when we're in labor, okay? And I'll say, 1521, water broke. 1525, urge to push. I write that stuff down. Okay? Yeah. Yep. And we keep them, we, we, I, 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 I keep them in there. Each kid has a box of his first year of life. And so each one has my uh, has my journal of when he was born is in there, and then all of the thank all of the baptism cards and all the little cards that he got and little trinkets and that kind of thing, and they all go in his little box. And at, and in the first year we tape it closed, and when they turn 18 we give it to him. Okay, and so each kid has it, and so my wife will go, no, 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 my water broke here, and I'm like, honey, I wrote it down at the time. Okay. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Okay. <laughs> and she'll go, really it was then? Yeah, it was then. Because <laughs> I know I can't win if I don't have it written down. Right? You need evidence about if it ain't that. documented, right. it wasn't done, right? That's right. Okay. Now, pelvic structure alteration. Now we're talking about indosocia, we're talking about the passageway, right? Now we've got problems with the structure of the pelvis, okay? Um, um, there's pelvic dystocia when you've got a misshapen pelvis, like a platypoid pelvis that makes it very difficult for baby to be born. Mm -hmm. And then there's soft tissue dystocia. Can you think of a soft tissue dystocia, something that would cause trouble for the baby to be born? Yeah. It's usually adipose tissue. Fat women with fat oh, pelvises easy. have a hard time delivering because there's a lot of extra cushion in and around the pelvis and they, they get what we call soft tissue dystocia. They can have trouble coming out just because there's, there's more adipose tissue around there and it makes it a little more difficult. The good news about adipose tissue is you can push it out of the way, okay? It kind of stretches and gets out of the way, but it's there. Another type of, uh, of soft tissue dystocia are small introiduses, the small vaginal openings, okay? When that won't open well enough to allow it to, to, to come out, okay? And women who have the, the, uh, a small vaginal introitus, they can, they can benefit from, um, from an episiotomy. I always say, though, that that vaginal introitus isn't strong as a baby. It'll break its way free if it needs to. Okay? And, and I've never had this, but it's a theoretical uh, concern, is women who had uh, female circumcision, uh, they tend to have very small vaginal openings that need to be opened for birth. Okay. Um, I don't know. What's that? I always thought that was mutilation. Well, there are, there are two ways. To, some people call it female genital mutilation, yes. and some people call it female circumcision. Now, I went to midwifery school. Uh, one of my professors was Dorcas Commanda, who was from Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. okay? she, had, she never told us, but it was pretty obvious that she had been circumcised by the way she talked about it. And she talked about female circumcision the same way we talk about male circumcision. Because it's okay? a culture. I mean, that's yeah, what they do that it was a cultural thing. They yeah. removed the clitoral hood and they exposed the prepice, which is exactly what we do for a circumcision. We remove the, the, the hood around the penis and we expose the prepice. The exact same thing. Okay? It's just a matter of, uh, of, of what you call it. Now, there are extreme forms of female circumcision where they will re you know, completely remove the labia uh, my, uh, the labia majora um, or the labia minora and then there are some where they will close the introidal opening up some um, or even al almost all the way certainly just like a friend of mine uh, grew up in the Philippines and he told the story that in his village they did circumcision at the age of 10 they would give the boys and it was a ceremonial thing they'd give the boys some leaves to chew on put his penis on a chopping block <laughs> pull it out and whack with a cleaver and that's how they circumcise what's that? There you I go. In our neighborhood, and they're like, "What are the boys doing, mom? Oh, they're getting, and they're wearing loose, like t-shirts. Yeah. And they're all lined up like, <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. And then you're like, ah, you're like, what are you doing? No, don't go there. And yeah. And they come out doing like this. <laughs> 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 Now that is pretty darn extreme yeah. male genital uh, mutilation, is it yeah. not? Holy cow! Yeah. So, you know, it's difficult. Yeah. Oh, related to that. Yeah. So, I watched two circumcisions last Friday. Uh -huh. And the doctor told me, like, there was a 20-year-old man 
So the wife said, like, you need to do circumcision before we get married. So he was 20 years old, and they did the circumcision. The friends were, like, joking around. They gave him magazine. After that, and he believed to that because he got it. Oh, because he got an erection? <gasps> oh. What the mm. You tear that stuff free. I guess it could, yeah. No, it so, didn't die, but it was yeah. Serious, yeah. So I don't, um, I, I don't use judgmental language when I talk about female circumcision. Okay, there are good and bad uh, for female circumcision, just like there are for male circumcision. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, there, there's that, there's, a, there's a cultural piece about you know subjugation of women and that kind of thing, and that's when we're starting to go overboard. Okay, right. but simply altering the, the the structure or the physical appearance of the vagina is is not necessarily bad in and of itself. Okay, it's just a decorative thing, right? So like, you know, when people ask me, should their sons be circumcised? I say, well, do you like V-necks or turtlenecks? Right. You're just altering the look of the penis. You're not changing its structure or its function. You're just changing the way it looks, okay? You are, you could say, and there are websites for this that talk about male genital mutilation right. because they circumcise. So it's, you know, we're taught in this country from our media to automatically shun it and this is bad and this is evil, but it's not necessarily bad. Well, not, well, not the article that I read about. I mean, I see, I see your point. Yeah. That's true because it is a cultural thing when it's done in that process. Right. But the process that I read about mm -hmm. was not that way. Sure, sure. It was very violent and against the person's will. Mm -hmm. So that's where I take offense. Sure, sure. That makes sense. Um, I, I don't see it much different from the little boys putting their penis on a chopping block. <laughs> and then as I understand it, the moil from the Jewish culture is very similar. They just pull it off and cut it. You know, nothing yeah. like we do with our, you know, gomcos and plastidols. But yeah, but you're, you're right. But, uh, um, but that could cause a soft tissue dystocia as well. And then I'm not exactly sure why trial of labor is here. Um, because I would put that somewhere else. Um, but a trial of labor means after a cesarean section, okay? There's a chance, well, I guess that it could be a soft tissue problem. So um, once you've had a cesarean section, when they do a C-section, they cut through the lower uterine segment, not the contractile portion of the uterus, the portion that's, that's more inert, okay? Um, and that area, because it's not contractile, is much stronger. And so if they go through the lower uterine segment for a C-section, they can close it back up again, and the next birth, they can have a vaginal delivery, okay? But the big problem is if anywhere from a 0.5% to a 1.5% chance that that scar will rupture where the, where, the, where the incision was. And if that happens, you will get the, you'll blow out that lower uterine segment and it'll cause an awful lot of soft tissue dystocia because the uterus can't contract anymore. When it tries to build up pressure, it comes out the lower uterine segment. Okay? I would not have put V back here and I'm, we're going we're gonna to talk about that separately later. But that's the soft tissue destruction uh, thing here. Um, amnio infusion. Okay. So remember earlier we talked about the if the baby's having variables and we think his cord is in the wrong place and we want to put some more fluid in, mm -hmm. that's amnio infusion. Okay, that's what it's called. We place an intrauterine pressure catheter into the uterus and we inflate the uterus with some extra fluid, usually 250 to 500 cc's of fluid. Okay. And that gives us an artificial amniotic fluid in there. Okay. The big problem is that you could put it on a pump and have it run whether it wants to or not. And then if you get fluid trapped in there, you can over distend the uterus. Okay. You can blow up that balloon and, and cause some problems. All right. You get distension of the uterus and it causes postpartum hemorrhage and all kinds of horrible stuff. Or you can even distend the uterus to the point where it, it knocks the placenta off the wall. Okay. So usually, most people who do amnio infusions do them to gravity. Okay. You set the amnio infusion to run to gravity, and you let it run in and out, and if there's too much pressure built in, gravity's not going to let it overflow. Okay. Um, the important things are carefully paying attention. What comes in, comes out. Okay. If you're doing an amnio infusion and you're putting fluid in, you had better see uh, IV fluid on the chucks. Okay. You had better see the evidence that it's leaking back out again. Okay? We don't want that fluid to build up in the uterus. We want it to come in, do its job, and come back out again as we continue to put more fluid in. Okay? Um, and what you'll see if you get an over-distended uterus is your contraction pattern will alter. Okay? You'll start to get this real funky um, contraction pattern where it's not going every two to three minutes anymore. And you start going, oh, now I need pit. 
Okay, you shouldn't. Okay, if one intervention leads to another intervention leads to another intervention, you want to make sure if the first intervention didn't cause the problem in the first place, right? All right, amniotomy. Amniotomy um, is is the releasing of the water, breaking the amniotic fluid, right, or breaking the bag. Uh, it can be used to augment labor. Specifically, the people it works best for are second, third, fourth time moms who are more than six centimeters dilated. Okay? Amniotomy in a first time mom has absolutely no clinical value. Okay? Everybody does it and it has no clinical value at all. Okay? Uh, or no consistent clinical value. It goes back to the whole p-value argument. You know, it might work on 30 or 40 percent of the people, but it's not going to work on most of the people. So, in my practice, I use amniotomy if I've got this woman admitted, her labor has stalled, and I'm, gonna, I'm thinking I want to use Pitocin. Well, I'll break your water just to see if that does the trick. With the understanding, I'll probably have to use Pitocin anyway. But if I can avoid Pitocin, I will. Okay? So when I talk about amniotomy to, to, induce, or to augment labor, that's what I'm trying to do, is prevent using a, a Pitocin. Okay? If I've got a woman who's laboring and she kind of stalls out and she's like six or seven centimeters and her contraction pattern kind of goes away, I'll break her bag in the hopes that I don't use Pitocin later on. Okay? The big deal about amniotomy, what do you think is the number one problem with the water breaking? Infection. Nope. More, more, if infection happens, okay? That's a long-term thing. What's the risk? What's the danger when the water breaks? The fetus. It's a problem with the baby. Not the contraction, not the cushion. What else? Cord prolapse. Exactly. That umbilical cord comes out with the water. Now you got trouble, right? Because talk about cord compression. When your umbilical cord is hanging on the outside, that baby's not getting any oxygen. Okay? And so it causes an emergency cesarean section. So whenever I break someone's water, you always want to make sure that, you, that there, there's, there's a low risk of the, of the cord coming out. The number one thing to do is, is the baby dropped low enough in the pelvis that he's going to seal that hole and block the cord from coming out? Yeah, that's a pretty good idea. Is the baby up here way away from the pelvis so that when I break her water, there's all this room for the cord to come out? Now, I'm not, they're, they're called too high to rupture, okay? Someone who's like minus two, minus three station are not safe to rupture. You want to wait for them to come down in the pelvis and rupture them a little bit later. Can you get away with it? Sure. Have I done it? Yeah. And the risk is that, okay, I would rather we didn't, but this is really the only option I have right now, so we're going to do this. And what, we, what, what I often, I've only done it two or three times, is I'll have the, the nurse grab the baby by the head and hold the baby in place, and then I'll break the water and she'll push the baby down into the pelvis and just kind of get him down in there so he sinks in there nice and deep and plugs plug up the hole. Okay. It's risky, but we did it on baby number four. No, mom delivered all my kids. Okay, well I caught I most of them. You, but I'm most of them. Okay. Baby number one, I was a cook, um, but uh, our midwife lived across the street, and so she let me put my hands on his head while we delivered the baby together. Okay. Baby number two, I was a nursing student, mm -hmm. so I started her IV, I put in her Foley, but I didn't catch the baby. Baby number three, I caught the baby. Baby number four, the baby number three, I was Dr. Dad. Yeah. I actually, like, there was, this was back in the days when we had delivery rooms and recovery rooms, and the doctors were like in space suits and everything was sterile, and so I was like all my sterile gown, and they put Dr. Dad on my chest, you know, with a mask, yeah, all that stupid stuff. <laughs> Baby number four, I did everything. I just said, well, you know, we'll come get you when we need you, <laughs> you know. And uh, baby number five, I was uh, a mother baby nurse over here, and they wouldn't let me. Right. And then baby number six, seven, and eight, I did. Same thing, just close the door, I'll take care of it when I, I'll call you if I need you kind of thing. Yeah. Yep. But the big thing about uh, amniotomy is watch for, cord com watch for the cord to prolapse, and document the amniotic fluid when it comes out. Okay, we're looking for a particular problem with amniotic fluid. What would it be? Ever heard anyone talk about the amniotic fluid is clear, or the amniotic fluid has odor? Uh, odor is, is chorioamnionitis. But what about fluid? What what could be in there? Anyone ever read anyone read anything about meconium? Oh yes. Right, meconium. It's a, it's baby poop. Sometimes baby poops before they're born, and they're breathing that stuff. 
and so that can make them pretty sick. So if you rupture the fluid, if you rupture the water and you get um, meconium stained fluid, then NICU needs to be present when the baby is born. Okay? All right, well, we're at 4.30, so I'm going to have to stop. Let's see, what are we missing? Induction of labor. Well, darn it. Okay, so we will cover the, um, the chapter 15 in the test, but we'll do up to chat, we'll do up to 14, which is the normal birth process. So 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Correct. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay. Tomorrow, preeclampsia drills. I posted uh, several articles, about 60 pages. There was 20 something. There you go, several. But each article is only like two pages. Okay. Yeah, I Yeah. Right, right. There are as many pages of references as there are pages of actual information. Okay? So don't print the whole thing. Just print the, the, the pages that have information on them and try not to print the, uh, try not to waste your time. But preeclampsia is going to be tomorrow. Okay? We are going to have a patient who has a hypertensive crisis. You are going to have to give labetalol. You are going to have to take care of seizures. Um, so know that stuff. Okay, understand what is preeclampsia, understand what the differences of the various types of preeclampsia are, okay, um, be it a, be it a um, preeclampsia, preeclampsia with severe features, chronic hypertension, preeclampsia superimposed on, on chronic hypertension, um, eclampsia, HELP syndrome, all of that stuff we're going to talk about tomorrow, okay, and you may have recognized this, but the more prepared you guys are, the more you get out of your lab. Okay? When, when I'm talking to a group of folks who haven't read anything and I have to teach you all of it, I can only skim the surface. Okay? But if everybody is well prepared, they've well read, they can, they can talk about stuff, I can move quickly through the basics and get into the really interesting stuff. Okay? So please, friend and I preparing for tomorrow. Okay? By the way, the schedule is posted. It's the same schedule that we were using before for the first lab. And it's under there under fall fall simulation. Okay. And we'll do um, 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 complicated pregnancies on the next test. A complicated delivery. That said, I think it'll be fair after tomorrow to include preeclampsia on the test next week. You don't agree? Well, in that case, you get the most complicated pregnancy complication, and you have to wait three weeks before we test about it. <laughs> it's, uh, would you rather test when it's fresh or when it was three weeks ago? Preeclampsia? Preeclampsia is um, chapter is it 11? Yeah. Chapter 11. Yeah, chapter 11. Yeah, it's 11.